Savage Weekend is a 1979 proto-slasher film directed by David Paulson. It's not the best of its kind, but I can get you through it with a few recommendations. First, the opening scene is taken from the end of the story, a woman in the woods being pursued by a killer. It's to sizzle and sell the steak. A promise of horrific violence and sleaze in return for your patience. So put that in your pocket as the story really begins in New York City, where Marie mourns her disintegrating marriage, but she has all the friends a soon-to-be-divorced New Yorker needs. A partying gal pal, a gay best friend, and a rich new boyfriend with property upstate. They make the trip to indulge in adult activities and forget their troubles, but Marie's heartache starts resembling PTSD. Meanwhile, someone's coming for Marie, and no one will get in his way. The cast and crew came up through the NYC theater scene, which may be why this movie feels like one oil lantern away from a Eugene O'Neill play. In regards to the acting, most of it is MST3K quality, but there are a couple of good performances. Take Nicky, played by Christopher Allport. He's less of a stereotype than I expected. Sure, the movie never lets you forget he's the gay guy, but he's gay second, and a guy from the Bronx first. He's interesting, has some funny lines, and of course he doesn't survive the movie. This guy with the impressive mustache is Mac, the local lumberman that begins to usurp Maria's husband's place in her fantasies. Mac's being played by David Gale, who was more used to playing bad guys and good guys even then. A few years later, he would lose the mustache and the twang to play the evil doctor from the Reanimator series. Now that's range. Mac has a charmingly grisly monologue starting at 17 minutes about Otis and the girl that broke his heart. Otis is the local yokel and the one the movie presents as the looming threat. He's played by William Sanderson and although he has a couple of graveside monologues that feel a bit too showy, he's still one of the movie highlights. His portrayal of Otis is a few shades removed from his Larry character on the CBS sitcom New Heart. So one way to watch this is imagine it's a prequel, a summer of unpleasantness before Otis changed his name and moved back in with his brothers in Vermont. Gorehounds might be disappointed to know that following the Otis story, there's another 35 minutes of melodrama and attempted sexual tension before somebody finally slips on a mask and starts their spree proper. All the ingredients for a slasher film are there, gratuitous nudity, on-screen fatalities, torture, bondage, but anyone who knows the works of Tom Savini will only see missed opportunities. The filmmakers were more interested in saying something, maybe about female sexuality, class conflict, maybe Vietnam, it was the 70s, who knows? Any threads that could have become actual themes seem to be dropped out the window with that guy around minute 72. The original movie premiered in a couple of theaters in 1976 under the title The Killer Behind the Mask, where it died a quick death. It was bought by a video distributor a few years later, got recut to hide some of the boom mics, got a gory unrelated cover slapped on the box art, and was retitled Savage Weekend, becoming an early staple of the VHS underground. The film fulfilled its purpose, establishing the creator's path to movies and television. David Paulson made one more horror movie before moving on to soap operas, writing, producing, and directing for Falcon Crest, Dallas, Dynasty. Caitlin O'Healy got her SAG card for accepting the role of the sex-hungry sister and parlayed that into a string of TV and movie roles in the 80s, including starring roles in the action series Tales of the Golden Monkey and the sitcom The Charmings. Christopher Allport had plenty of TV appearances over two decades, but his most notable role was Sheriff Sam Tyler, nemesis of that killer snowman in the cult horror Jack Frost films. And William Sanderson is still in demand today, having appeared in everything from Blade Runner to Deadwood. This movie is currently in the public domain, an orphan of its own creators, but it's got bits and pieces worth a look, and the opening setup pays off in the end. We get to know what puts that smile on Otis's face.